Yeah. Right, I was trying to give people a little bit more time to come because I know everybody's got a busy schedule. And so that's why I'm sorry you kept waiting a little bit longer. But thanks so much for arriving. First of all, thank you very much for joining me. This is the third of our uh, supposedly, hopefully, quarterly presentations for the Canvas Valley History Group. I'm Paul Wynn. I represent that group. We all bring different skill sets, different things to the group. We have members uh, amongst us. Uh, I was really keen to have them stand up and sort of recognize, but I think most of you know that people like Pants, Deb, obviously Deb. I thought I'd give her a chance to embarrass herself. Right? But no, these are the people that are the lifeblood of this uh, group that we have. Uh, we've managed to keep it going through COVID. Uh, so we've got no excuse to, to let it fail now. And our objective is really just to try and preserve and then hand over and make interesting and then hand over the history of the valley. You'd be surprised how interesting it is. Uh, you saw, hopefully, so you saw the last two presentations we did. The first one was on uh, Joe Frazier, who's not uh, coming here, he's doing something else today. Uh, his grandfather, Leo Frazier, uh, who was at Stanford Book Three, uh, which is where the Great Escape film. Uh, mm -hmm concept uh, came Hollywood sort of glamorized a little bit. So hopefully we did that uh, particular exploit in, in Leo's justice. We, we tried. Uh, the last uh, presentation we did was on rascals, reprobates, and I've forgotten what the third one was there. Rose, of course. I mean, it was a fun way of trying to present some people's lives in the past, which we should not judge. I mean, we can't possibly judge. Uh, we can't be referees to the past. We're supposed to learn lessons from the past. And that was really what we were trying to do with that presentation. Uh, today is the exact 180 degree opposite. We're hoping to try and give you an insight into some of the people's lives uh, in the past and much not too distant past either, which I think most of us would call heroes. There's certainly people who would be proud to know or proud to relate to, or maybe even proud to be. Um, there's a collection of them. It's a selection. You can see it's doctors, dreamers, builders, banks, uh, not bankers. I don't think anybody's a hero from a banker, but uh, <laughs> more importantly, there's a bit of fun about um, some bank issues in the in this stuff. Uh, it's called the robbery school, a better word. And um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Deborah Lambert and her son Sean. Deb is our chairman. Uh, boards, uh, boards of Earth Sins. She's happy to chair our group, but more importantly, she's done the last two presentations and she certainly thinks uh, an awful lot in terms of getting those presentations from life. Without Beth Beavis, though, I think we all recognize we would struggle to have anything to present. Beth is our archivist, that's one of the biggest collections of any local history that I've ever come across, and I'm a bit of a history buff. Uh, so I've come across some various communities and um, what they've done in the history. Uh, Bev has collected that over maybe 40 odd years, maybe a little bit longer, Bev. It's beautifully archived. Any of you that come to our events, our events, their events, we the uh, gate crash so yesterday, Monday, day, et cetera. It's in Canvas, that's an event. We gate crashes, you come to them and you see our um, event uh, on the museum there or whatever we're presenting. Please stop by the desk and have a look at the books, some of the books, only a few, the better compile. It uh, helps us archive that history. Okay, without further ado, I'll leave it with the uh, capable hands of Deb and Sean. And, sure. and uh, well, I don't think this is on, Paul. There's a button. Oh, you've got to press that. So one thing okay, got, do, got it. Just to test you. All right, so our last uh, presentation, if you were here, I, pre I promised you that we would focus on less rascally people. Well, actually there is one kind of a rascal that we're gonna talk about. He's an interesting fellow that um, was definitely colorful. Um, you will probably recognize some names. We have tried to portray the actual photos of people or places involved, but if none, could be found, we used images that resemble what we were talking about. So in other words, you need to use your imagination. The Camas Valley History Group believes the purpose of our group is to capture and share history as accurately as possible. As you will see, we, will, we tried to stick to what the newspapers of the time reported, realizing that newspapers are not always accurate. 
If we get the facts wrong, we ask that you correct us with reliable evidence, or if you have any additional insight into the lives of these men and women, please share them. But please probably wait till the end, but whatever, whatever. As you listen, if you do have questions, we'll do our best to answer them. So the first group that we'll be discussing are the three, do are three doctors uh, that have lived in the Valley that have particularly interesting stories. But first we should address the midwives of Sorry, the we're Valley. Sorry, we're all messed up here. <laughs> okay. So Got it. these women took care of the other women in the Valley, especially when it comes to childbirth. Before any trained doctor lived and practiced in Camas Valley, there were midwives that helped meet the medical needs of the Valley. Here are three that ministered to the health needs of people in the Valley. They could travel up to 20 miles on horseback in any kind of weather to care for the sick. This is a list of doctors serving at least part-time in Camas, with Dr. Lawrence being the first. The buildings are some of the places where doctors treated patients. The home shown on the upper right corner belonged to Lucy Williams and was to have served as a hospital for a time. If any of you have information about Lucy or the hospital, please share it with us afterwards. An interesting side note, the Miners Hospital was bought and run by a Camas woman, Margaret Alice War Clark, when the Miners Union closed it. She ran it from 1919 to 1939. Dr. John Kumagai was born in 1921 to a first generation Japanese American couple. He grew up in a rough and tumble town of Rock Springs, Wyoming. He admits it was not easy to be a minority during that time and in that place. The Kumagais got an unexpected breakthrough. A Japanese friend in Utah who wanted to sell his grocery business in Salt Lake. First of all, he was a coal miner. And there was a terrible explosion. Sorry, we got the pages up, by the way. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, so, Kumagai said, I tried for years to fit in with the Caucasian kids. He was part of a family of five children, and his parents struggled to make ends meet during the Depression. After a terrible mine explosion in Kemmerer, Wyoming, his father quit the mine and found safer work. He spent the next decade as a janitor for the local movie theater. Now, moving on, <laughs> they this is when they got their break to come to uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, he was quoted saying, we all moved to Salt Lake City and I spent many of my teenage years helping in the store. After graduating, he moved back to Wyoming. He said, I went to work on the railroad as a gandy dancer, a track worker. I just wanted something different. But one thing I learned was that I wasn't cut out to raise hell and live paycheck to paycheck. Gandy dancer is slang for early railroad workers, section hands who laid and maintained railroad tracks. In 1941, the same year the US entered World War II, he returned to Salt Lake City and applied to the U of U, and shortly after that, he applied to the university's medical school. He said, I applied, but I didn't think I would be accepted because there was so much ill feelings against the Japanese. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, many Japanese Americans were rounded up for internment camps. Fortunately, the Kumagai family was not among them. At medical school, the students accepted him. I finally found a place where I fit in. He studied hard, but gives credit to his mother who took in washing to help pay for his school expenses. Because of the accelerated degree programs during the war, he was able to graduate in 1946. He accepted a one-year internship in New York City where he did lots of sightseeing because it was free and he lived in Greenwich Village. His first job out of med school was this, at the state, Utah State Hospital, the large mental institution. He was not happy there. Dr. Kumagai got the chance to take over the practice of retiring Park City Dr. Dr. Oniki. He and his wife took a fateful ride through Camas Valley. They stopped at Simpson Drug. They met some locals who said the town was in desperate need of a doctor. In 1957, he ended up practicing medicine for the next 26 years out of a modest office between the drugstore and the movie theater. 
He remembers having a few initial doubts about moving into a small, closely knit rural community, but they were quickly dispelled. I was wrong, <laughs> he said. He had no emergency backup and was on call 24 hours a day. Along with family practice, he also attended patients in the hospital in Colville, Heber, and Miners Hospital in Park City. He did a lot of driving. He said, even though I wasn't trained in surgery, I did a lot of it. Sometimes I pitched in as an anesthesiologist, and we always did our own x-rays and lab work. He also delivered plenty of babies, some in the hospitals, a few in my office, and a couple of cars. During the early years of his practice, he didn't have the luxury of paramedics or local ambulance. If we had a real emergency, I would get in touch with John Bigelow, who owned a, the Chanis Cafe next door. He had a station wagon that he was good enough to use as an ambulance. John and I would race down the canyon. He said, the people really welcomed us, and my children did very well up here. In 1996, the people of Camas gave Dr. Kumagai the recognition he deserves, according to a city proclamation, whereas Dr. Kumagai was respected and trusted by his patients, nurses, and fellow physicians, many of whom still seek his advice and counsel, and whereas Dr. Kumagai is a trusted physician, neighbor, and friend, be it therefore resolved that February 1996, February 12th, 1996, is Dr. John Y. Kumagai Day. So many of you, and myself included, knew Dr. Kumagai, but I want to ask how many of today were delivered by Dr. Kumagai? All right. <laughs> Wowzers. All right. All right. Were you the ones in the car? <laughs> Awesome. The baby sitting next to you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. On to our next doctor. Air quotes, doctor. The name is Dr. Samuel Augustus Marshall, or so we think. <laughs> the problem with Doc Marshall is uh, that's what they called him, but the whole situation surrounding his very existence in the valley is kind of a mystery. As far as we know, these are all the things that are at least mostly true about him. Here's what we absolutely know for certain is real, okay? When you wanna find out about a person, you establish the probable truth and find the evidence or any official records that are mentioned uh, with their name. This is what we know. Uh, we know that he was born in Boston. We know that he was the oldest of seven kids. Uh, we know that he married at 27. May um, maybe. Probably. That's, <laughs> that's one that we don't know for absolute certain. Uh, we know that he may have worked in silver plating at some point. Came to Utah in 1868. Um, and we also know that we know for almost completely certain that he, then in 1885, he remarried in Salt Lake City, had a son, divorced before the son was born, uh, and then that son was adopted by another couple. And that's what we found out in our search for his uh, ancestors or his descendants. Life. These are a couple of other things we know. Uh, Richard Melville Lambert, great, great grandpa and grandma, uh, who settled out near where he lived, knew him and talked about him a lot. Um, they would say that he would yell down the road at dinner time, wanting Elva to bring him dinner at times. So that kind of that kind of guy, right? <laughs> uh, we do know that he's buried in Marion Cemetery. So at the very least, we you know we assume there's a body there. Uh, we call people call him Doc Marshall, and according to his death certificate. He was a doctor of patent medicine. Okay. His gravestone was spelled Marshall. And this, that again, where the weird mystery questions come up, right? Um, but, yep, that's what it says right here on the screen. 
So we do have these old bottles of his snuff that he would sell. Um, for those, if, if you don't know what snuff is, I, I imagine- uh, It comes up, it comes up, yeah. But we'll, oh, that's not this slide, okay. So. Oh, <laughs> this is a theory I came up with. When you want to find out about the person, like you said, you find out facts for them. So um, I couldn't, the facts I showed you are the ones that we found. Everything else, he did not exist on the planet. So um, after much pondering, I came up with a theory. When he came to Camus, I think he invented, or nowadays they call it reinvented himself. He rebranded himself. There's no evidence of his existence as a doctor before he came to Camus. And there's little or no evidence of his existence at all. I guess I should be talking into this, huh? Um, so before 1906, the FDA um, and much later, anyone could make and sell patent medicine. Uh, it's my theory that there were two major things of the time period that really influenced his persona. The first was the patent medicine because it was a lucrative business. And Sean, take it over. And to talk a little bit more about that, uh, before the Federal Drug, and Federal Drug Administration came into being, uh, anyone could make and sell medicine, like we said, uh, with any ingredients. So sometimes called a proprietary medicine. It's an over-the-counter medicine or medicinal preparation that is typically protected and advertised by a trademark uh, and trade name and claimed to be effective against minor disorders and symptoms. Its contents are typically incompletely disclosed. Now, that's according to Wikipedia, but I mean, you know, it's, it's bad it, medicine. It's all true. All right. Here's some examples. Yes, here are some examples of popular medicine of the time. Uh, you can notice with cocaine and heroin, you can see why these uh, were so popular. With, with arsenic, strychnine, and radium, I'm surprised the doctors had many return customers because I understand that's not good stuff. Um, this is a good one. The um, ingredients of alcohol, cannabis, chloroform and morphia, morphine, um, you can imagine the effects of the one night cough syrup. Now picture this, uh, maybe after ingesting the alcohol mixed with the cannabis, chloroform and morphine, you may only last one night, thus the name. Um, cocaine also was very popular uh, for nearly everything, everything. And I understand for some people it still is, but uh, you don't see it in uh, medicine so much. It's a little harder to come by, <laughs> typically. Unless you know what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we have this because of the bizarre nature and sad consequences of what patent medicine was all the way up until kind of the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Dr. Winslow's soothing syrup. Mrs. Winslow. Mrs. Winslow. Blame it on a woman. <laughs> and other such 19th century medications led to the deaths of thousands of infants. Several children died from withdrawal symptoms after having taken the medication for an extended period of time, but most simply fell asleep never to wake up. Knowing little about drug reactions at the time and due to the high mortality rates in the 19th century, the cause of deaths were often blamed on crib death or what we would today call SIDS or whatever ailment that was causing the child to be fussy enough to drug in the first place. Even with articles in the medical journals, the products were not withdrawn from sale until 1930. Can you imagine that stuff was around 1930? And we always read about the high infant rate. They're suggesting this might be one of the reasons. So imagine. The high death rate in infants. You can find several advertisements during the patent medicine period for Dr. Marshall's Qatar snuff. Uh, and, and this is where we, uh, where we get that. Um, it was 
used to clear congestion, okay, as a form of medicine. Uh, and it's just made out of tobacco leaves. Right? And laudanum. Yeah. And laudanum, yes. Uh, and peppermint essence, which I assume is just peppermint oil, right? Uh, camphor, which hazel extract, and acetate, I said I still can't pronounce that word. And in case you forgot what laudanum is, contains morphine prepared from opium and formerly used as a narcotic. And then this other stuff is basically just aspirin. Tanilla, the sodomy. So, so that was the real Dr. Marshall's formula. We are not sure what was in our Doc Marshall's formula, unless anyone here took it. George, did you ever take it? <laughs> you ever take the laudanum tobacco? <laughs> okay. Um, now. So, so we're fighting now. So uh, our Doc Marshall, I, I always have to try to figure people out. And these are some things I've come up with. His last name really was Marshall. And he had the good fortune to have access to Doc Marshall's bottles. Uh, number two, he had the bottles and upon moving to Camus, changed his name to Marshall to invent a new and improved person. Does anybody else have a speculation of what, what or who he might be? Has anyone here had their relatives talk about him? If I were to go back and get a master's or a doctorate in history, he, this would be my project. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Lambert legend. He's a Lambert legend. Yeah. Okay. So now on to the second thing, okay, that we mentioned besides patent medicine. Uh, it was gold. Okay. Now we know that he purchased land on the west side of Camus, where there's currently the big green water tank, that hill. Uh, there were also holes dug into the hill that resembled mines. Um, and there was a lot of craze that even kind of comes back down to today with uh the Uinta gold mines and everything like that. Uh, the craze around old Spanish mines. Uh, he became obsessed with the old Spanish mines and firmly believed that the holes in the hill that he owned uh, were indeed some of those. Um, and then of course, you know, many others at this time and again, even into today uh, are still likewise obsessed. And I've recently learned from a family member that he supposedly owned uh, seven mines on the West Hills over there. In October 1898, the Salt Lake Herald summed up what was thought about old Spanish mines. It says, old Spanish mines seem to be all the rage in Utah mining circles at the present time. The reason for this, of course, is that instead of actually going out and prospecting for new let pay dirt you just have it right there ready to go right it's easy so any hole in the ground could be an old spanish mine he's ad-libbing by the way <laughs> it's true okay go ahead uh in 1893 the wasatch wave reported that dr dr marshall was struck has struck it rich in the old spanish mine he has been working on so long one party claims he saw six or seven bars of silver and two bars of gold that the doctor had melted out, the gold bars being worth about $70 each. Imagine. <laughs> we only hope it is true as it will boom this section wonderfully. I, I don't think it was true, personally. <laughs> I, I have no doubts. In June of 1898, he was interviewed by a reporter who seemed to think old Doc Marshall was eccentric, among other things. Here are some of the quotes from the article. Claims to be an authority on the subject of old Spanish mines, although they may not be correct. The doctor is working what he claims to be an old Spanish mine. He claims that the Spaniard or some prehistoric race carried on mining in this part of the country as early as 1313. Not sure how he figured that out. Aliens came down and told him. <laughs> Ask some people. Uh, as yet, no one has been able to find any values of moment in the ore as yet. Love how they talked back, how they wrote back then. 
The doctor expects to be able to prove that it will run all of $100,000 to the ton. The ancients did not utilize present methods of metal extraction and reduction, were still yet they were still able to produce wealth galore. The scientists, geologists, and experts of today would laugh in their sleeves to hear Dr. Marshall dilate on what he believes. So, oh, there it is. So now we come to a more modern era. Uh, in 1893, the Wasatch oh. Wave reported, well, a little bit more modern, thank you. They were the same time. In 1893, the Wasatch Wave reported that Camus is badly in need of a first-class doctor, and one would do extra well here if he was a good one and understood his business. It's a fine opening for some smart young MD. It would then proceed to take, 13. oh, 13 years before that position was filled. By Dr. T.A. Dannenberg. Thomas Alexander Dannenberg was the doctor in Camus from 1906 to 1928. He was born in Texas in 1880 to first-generation German immigrants. Side note. Side note. You'll notice that our two first doctors we're talking about, well, besides Marshall, uh, one was from Japan, had Japanese-American, and the other one was German-American. And if you know about World War I and World War II, they were here at approximately those times. So it's interesting that we had the doctors that, of our of our enemies here, but they were welcomed and loved. Good job, Camus. Yep. All right. <laughs> Dr. Dannenberg said he was born into poor financial circumstances, but worked hard and was able to graduate from Physicians and Surgeons College of San Francisco in 1904. He married Maud Lorraine Reynolds in 1905, who was from Woodland. The couple came to Camus in 1906, and he set up practice in the old Camus drugstore. He performed many operations there. Dr. Dannenberg owned one of the Valley's first cars, which had no headlights. Two local youths, Dave Park and Vic McCormick, would take turns sitting on the engine holding a lantern so that he could see the road at night. He was always ready to go wherever he was called, no matter what the time. Was that a steam powered car? This is just a picture off the, uh, he had a, a Kate, Kate found it, Kate, Kate found that he drove a 1915 Buick touring car. That, so, yeah, we actually found the registration for him and that was his car. So an expensive car to be sure. Probably Oops, like there. under to $200. Yeah, he could afford it. <laughs> now. Do these headlines look familiar from 2020, 2021? History echoes. They're head, these are headlines from 1918. The pandemic, called the Spanish flu, lasted two years from 1918 to 1920. Okay, so we look at these numbers here. And it infected? Infected 500 million people worldwide. One, one out of three. Uh, one out of three people total. In the entire world, 50 million dead uh, and 675,000 in the United States. In the United States. Pretty drastic uh, problem. With, and this is the time, pe time period during which Dr. Dannenberg was serving here in it, Camas. Now, to compare, uh, we've got 609 million worldwide infected to, with COVID 19. 6.5 million deaths and 1.5 million in the United States. So uh, our, our medical technology has severely, significantly improved still. Except in the United States. Just kidding. Dr. Dannenberg was the doctor in the Valley during the Spanish influenza of 1918. And of course it was a very serious problem. <laughs> Obviously. It's, 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 uh, uh, mirrored uh, 120 years ago. I'm serious. I mean, you find all this stuff. Now, about six months into the pandemic, this article was published in the Park Record. Praise to our Dr. T.A. Dannenberg. Due to his wonderful work, together with the good people, the influenza epidemic has been entirely stamped out in the districts of Bench Creek, Woodland, Francis, Camas, 
and Marion. We have had no new cases for three weeks. At the present time, the, these districts are quarantined against all other towns. The roads are guarded day and night to prevent people from entering. In case important business calls anyone out of these towns on returning must be isolated for four days. We sincerely wish that all towns had as capable a doctor as the town of Kent. So we were quarantined. He, he shut down the roads. So that's why we didn't get, we, they didn't get. Uh, yeah. It's not COVID, it's just the flu. <laughs> it is the, the, the old one, it's not the new one. Yeah. All right, we want this story to be true. We really do. Uh, we selfishly want Camas Valley to be a part of this amazing history. If it's true, our dreamer is Daniel Judd Mitchell. Who here is related to the numerous Mitchells in the valley? Okay, you were uh -huh. going to put it on Facebook to get everybody here. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Daniel Mitchell's parents were Benjamin T. Mitchell and Lois Judd. He married Elmira Frotton who was the daughter of early settler George Broughton of Woodland. The interesting thing about the Mitchell family, uh, of course, they have many descendants here of the numerous, innumerable even, descendants here in Camas Valley. Now, should be noted, Utah is the second driest state in the country, uh, right behind Nevada. So water is a very precious commodity. Francis was settled later than any of the other communities in the valley because it lacked easy access to water. In order to get water, first they dug a canal. The South Bench area, Francis lacked water and using picks and shovels, the first settlers dug a canal 134 feet below the bench from the Provo River. The men were granted shares in the South Camas Irrigation Company according to the amount of work they did on the canal. 7th August, 1873, water started to flow in the canal. Farmers could irrigate their ground and women could get water for homes instead of hauling it from the Provo River. In 1890, the Washington Irrigation Company was formed. As more people moved to this area, the canal became inadequate. Another canal was built on contract at $2 per yard. A man doing hard labor for 10 hours was able to make no more than $2 per day. The canal leaked like a sieve when the water was turned into it, making it necessary for all the holes to be lined with clay. The process was repeated every year for several years. Not terribly efficient. Now this is, now we're looking here on your left, sorry, uh, Joseph R. Murdoch, who was president of the Wasatch Stake and a water engineer, conveniently. He informed James Prescott, Francis, the president of Washington Irrigation Company, that Francis could continue to use high water through the canal, but when the spring runoff had abated and water was low, Francis could no longer use the water because of Heber's water rights. James Prescott called the farmers together and Francis filed a lawsuit against Heber. Heber won the lawsuit. People of Francis not only lost their water, which placed their crops in jeopardy, but had spent money on which they could not afford to lose in fighting the suit. In the meantime, Provo had filed the suit and taken the water from Heber. <laughs> uh, exhausting. Daniel J. Mitchell. And uh, water fights still continue, but they were very uh, significant the next 20 years. Daniel J. Mitchell was the Bishop of the Francis Ward at the time, and the matter of water probably weighed heavy on his mind. There's a story about Daniel Judd Mitchell, and we hope the story is true where he had a dream where he was among the natural lakes in the Uintas and saw a way that they could be dammed. The water stored and brought it down to the settlements to use. James Prescott and Bishop Mitchell related the plan seen in the dream to Murdoch. The men examined the area and decided that the Washington Irrigation Company would use the lakes north of the Provo River. The people of Heber would use the lakes south of the Provo River. In 1983, Trial Lake was the first lake in the area used as a reservoir on a trial basis. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, to see if the idea was feasible. On October 1914, 15 mountain lakes had been dammed off and the first reservoirs built in Utah had been completed. In 1994, the mountain lake dams were discontinued and the water was stored in a newly built Jordanelle Reservoir. The, his the history books 
give Heber credit for the reservoirs, but we know every great accomplishment starts with a dream. And we say thank you to Dad Mitchell. There we go. All right. Does, yeah. any, does anybody have more information on that? Because we haven't proved the story. We just want it to be true. Okay, <laughs> Just like a lot of people do. Okay. So the three builders that we want to focus on today, okay, at least briefly, are Benjamin Mitchell, father of Daniel Mitchell, Lawrence Fitch, and Moses Whitaker Taylor, father of Moses C. Taylor of bank fame. And he is one of the sons of John Taylor, third president of the Latter-day Saint Church. Side note, he's the great-great-grandfather of our very own Gordon and Steve Taylor. Life on what would eventually become Utah was not easy when the Mormons arrived in 1847. To survive, they adapted to its harsh environment by forming communities and relying on one another to survive. The people were asked by their ecclesiastic leaders to tithe or donate 10% of their income, property, and labor to the church every year. Local church leaders gathered these resources in tithing houses, which were built in every settlement. These tithing houses were used to manage and redistribute any accumulated surplus for the collective good of the community. During this period between 1847 and the early 1900s, money as we know it didn't really exist. In Utah, early Mormon settlers relied on barter for their necessities. These tithing houses played a major role in the economic life of each community. For example, if someone needed grain, they deposited what they had, such as a chicken. Or if they needed eggs, they deposited some hay. Or if they had neither chicken nor grain, they donated their own labor. Many new immigrants to Utah worked for the tithing house before finding more permanent jobs in their communities. Kind of like Deseret Industries <laughs> nowadays. In more modern context, yes. Labor donated the tithing house was used for local public works projects, such as constructing irrigation systems, grist and lumber mills, or other community buildings. The Salt Lake City Temple, for example, was built largely through labor coordinated through the tithing house. During the clash with Indians throughout Utah in the 1860s, tithe labor uh, was used to build forts for protection and defense. People in need could borrow from the resources stored at tithing houses, and many became indebted. Communities took this debt very seriously, and on occasion, violence could break out if people tried to leave without paying it back. Tithing houses, also called tithing offices or tithing granaries, were virtually part bank, part warehouse, part employment exchange. These houses were key in how early Mormons survived and thrived in the harsh environment of the Mountain West. Camas Valley, like all other communities in Utah, had a tithing house. From approximately 1871 to the early 1900s, a sturdy rock building was not only a tithing house, but served many other purposes. Residents of the valley brought their one-tenth tithing of grain, vegetables, livestock, and labor to the tithing house. The surrounding lot was filled with stacks of tithing hay, while the vegetables and other produce were stored in the basement. Starting out as a tithing house, the building served Camas Valley for the next 150 years, until the first proper meeting house was built in 1901. Residents gathered on the main floor to hear gospel sermons. A passage written by a longtime resident around 1935 says this, the people gathered here to listen to gospel sermons while mice scuttled across the floor, spiders wove a lace network across the window panes and aroma of rotting potatoes from the depths below. The iron stove just in front of the pulpit where we roasted our faces and froze our backs. The intricate stonework was put in place by Benjamin and Joseph Smith Mitchell. We are not sure when the plaster was added, possibly when the building was constructed or later. Old timers report that as children, they would come to church early so they could slide down the cellar door. A bell tower held a bell that called people to service. The bell is now in front of the DUP building. Benjamin Thomas Mitchell, a noted stonemason, and his son Joseph Smith Mitchell cut the sandstone to build the structure. John O'Driscoll, plastered the walls. Benjamin T. Mitchell lived in Camas for only a short time. Here are his statistics. Seven wives, 48 kids, two wives that lived in Camas, notably, 
and eight children that lived or settled in and around the Camas Valley. So all of the Mitchells that live here are most likely related to these eight folks down here. The other five wives lived either in Mill Creek or Salt Lake. Camas Valley was fortunate to have an experienced stonemason, and the case of Benjamin T. Mitchell is somewhat noted and famous one. He and his son, Joseph Smith Mitchell, a longtime resident of Camas, cut the sandstone and built the and, and built the structure of our uh, Tithy tithing Tithy. house. As a noted stonemason in church history, he was a mason on the Nauvoo Temple and the Salt Lake Temple, being the foreman of the Salt Lake Temple for a time. Uh, he sculpted the first sunstone on the Nauvoo Temple, and he created the Great Salt Lake Basin Meridian Marker. This stone marker was placed in August of 1847 when beginning the original survey for the Great Salt Lake City. The city streets were named and numbered from that point. He helped develop Deseret Salt Lake City as a stonemason by constructing commercial and government buildings such as the ZCMI, the courthouse, and a bank building. Whether that's the fancy original Zions Bank, I, I was never able to find out. Okay. Sometime in the 1930s, a porch was added to the Tide to, House, okay, yeah. and the abandoned building became housing for employees of the Brooklawn Cream Brooklawn Creamery. Yeah, that, I said that right. Located in Oakley. From the 1950s to the 1970s, it served as a jail. As you can see, a 14 inch with 14 inch walls and a very generally scary environment, those in the jail probably do not want to return. For the next 50 years, the tithing house served as the Camas City Building, where the mayor had an office, the city council met, and a judge would hold court for the citizens of the valley. Oh, this historic, this historic and treasured building still stands at 30 North Main Street as a reminder and tribute to the largely successful economic system used in early Utah. When the new Camas City building was built in the 2000s, the old tithing house probably not realizing its return to its original purpose. It was used as the community action center and food bank serving Camas Valley residents in need. In 2021, the building was sold to a private party who hopefully will maintain the building's historic integrity. Most communities have placed their tithing houses onto the National Historic Register and use them as museums or other community heritage, heritage sites. We are very lucky to still have our tithing house and hope that it will remain. Boop, 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 boop. So oh. soon after I arrived in Camas Valley in 1992, I started to notice uh, several beautiful Victorian style houses around uh, the valley. I soon learned that my husband and father-in-law were born in the one that used to stand behind my house, which is the one in the lower left corner. And they tore it down in the 50s. All of these homes were built by the same guy, Loris Ernst Fitch. Nice. Fitch was a carpenter, builder, and a casket maker who had settled in Camas in the 1890s. These houses are fine and rare examples of the East Lake architectural style in rural Utah. Mr. Fitch built several houses of this style in the valley. The homes were elaborately decorated with checkerboard panels, latticework, hand-turned posts, and decorated with fancy gingerbread cider. The East Lake Movement was a 19th century architectural and household design reform movement started by British architect and writer Charles East Lake. Fitch married Cora Lewis in 1886 in San Diego. Uh, they were later divorced. When married, they, he then married Rosanna Evans. They married in Colville in 1899 and settled in camps. Rosanna is the daughter of William Llewellyn Evans and Rose Hanna, who were early settlers of the valley. This is the home he built for himself and his family. It still resides on Main Street and has been many things. Right now, it's a doggy daycare. Very little can be found about the man himself. However, this was found in an article about a couple from Hoytsville, Albert and Martha Ann Mills. They hired Fitch to build their house, and they related this about the man. 
While quite competent, he had a bit of a drinking problem. In order to keep him on the job, Martha and Albert had to board him over the weekends to be sure he'd remain to complete the work. Yikes. <laughs> In the, on the 1st of March, 1889, uh, edition of the Salt Lake Herald, the short paragraph was found. It says, work has commenced on the new meeting house. And as this is something really necessary here, it should have the heartiest support and be pushed to completion as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, the local Latter-day Saints had met in the tithing house for the last 17 years or so and decided to build a lovely new building. Since Ellie Fitch was building elegant houses in the town, why not build a church? First Camas Ward Meeting House was located on the corner of 100 East and 100 South. It was begun in 1889. It took many years to complete the ornate, intricately designed structure, and ward members held meetings in part of the building before it was finished. Those were the days the local members built the churches, so volunteer labor could be slow. In April 1901, 12 years after work started on the building, the newly called stake president, Moses Whitaker Taylor, visited Camas and its partially finished church building. He wrote, we visited the new meeting house at Camas, which was in unfinished condition, being unpainted without floor, steps to read it, steps to read it and no doors. Neither was there any warm coating on the windows cased. Although it was plastered, the saints were still meeting in the room by the tithing cellar. He continues, I suggested to the brethren that we may hold a conference in Camas on May 5th. This pleased them. The brethren and sisters accepted the suggestion and said that they, that though they only had 10 days and the material was hard to get, that they could still do it. They voted to finish by May 5th as far as possible. Under the guidance of Bishop Samuel F. Atwood, it was completed on May 5th in time for the conference. Those hardworking people from Camas, given a challenge or goal, finished it as far as possible by the by the deadline. Ten days. <laughs> Do all the finish. <laughs> Tragically, less than ten months later, the beautiful building burned to the ground. The Colville Times reported that it is supposed that the fire originated by some boys trying to burn soot out of the chimney, and in some way the blaze caught the wood up near the ceiling. Saddened but undaunted, the ward members started a new building, this time in brick, in the same location. It was finished in 1904 and remained in use until 1984, 80 years, when the land was brought by the city, bought by the city, and the building was demolished. Who here attended church in that building? Yeah. Too bad they tore it down. Yeah. All right. Camus had its very own bank, and it also had two particularly interesting bank robberies. So, the Camus State Bank was established in 1909 with about $25,000 worth of capital. Five years later, its resources increased to $123,000. It paid 6 to 7% dividends paid every year. The depositors were from Camus, Idaho, Salt Lake, and the Uinta Basin. It was a pretty far reaching little bank. We couldn't find exact people that started the bank. We know that John Hoyt was one. And these were some of the very early um, directors and officers. Now, during the Great Depression, 1929 to 1933, which were the worst years of it, 30% of all banks in the US and Utah failed. Camas State Bank, not. R.L. King, Joseph B. Hoyt, and James A. Knight by their efforts and hard work, saved the bank from closing. <laughs> the 1930s had a period of famous gangsters and bank robberies, which were a popular activity. In 1932, Camas State Bank was robbed. Not by these guys. Yeah, no, John Dillinger didn't come to Camas. <laughs> from the headlines, Camus, August 19th, Mrs. Wilford Lewis narrowly missed death at the hands of crack men who robbed the state bank between $200 and $300 at 3 a.m. Friday. A manhunt participated in by sheriff's posses of three counties started soon after the robbery. 
All roads and mountain retreats in Weber, Parleys, and Provo Canyons are being scoured by Posse. For $200. <laughs> a lot of money back then. Entrance to the bank was gained through a rear window pried open with a pick stolen from a nearby blacksmith shop. The officers believe the robbers hastily planned their job and were not equipped with professional kits. Baffled by the burglar-proof door to the bank's main safe, they blasted open a small silver chest in which small change and papers were kept. The thieves got away with between $200 and $300 in small change and some of the bank's valuable papers that will be of no use to them whatsoever. The robbers had no place to insert their explosives. Professional safe men would not have used the quantity of powder or nitroglycerin used in opening the silver chest. The blast was so heavy that it blew apart the safe door through the bank's front windows. Roads were quickly closed out of canvas. Officers expected to be met with gunfire. Mr. and Mrs. Lewis were awakened in their house across the street from the bank by the blast and set off by the safe blowers. Mr. Lewis rushed to the street to investigate just as three men emerged from the bank building and started to run away. They shouted to Mr. Lewis to go back into his house and started firing. Mrs. Lewis was standing in the doorway of the house and closed the door ju just as one of the men shifted his aim toward her. The bullet lodged in the door directly in front of her. Yikes. Instead of returning to his home, Mr. Lewis hid behind a fence to watch the robbers who were soon out of sight. He was unable to tell the investigating officers whether they fled north toward Weber Canyon or south toward Provo. An all day and all night vigil on all roads leading out of Camas was so has so far failed to uncover the trail of three bandits who looted the small silver chest at Camas State Bank. Now on August 26th. Sensational capture by Provo police officers at 315. The Desperados were captured by police by Armel Milner and Alan Ullman, the night watchman of the Hotel Roberts. The suspects were seen lurking around the alleyway of the hotel, presumably to rob it. The robbers were taken to Salt Lake City Police Headquarters. While checking for weapons, one of the three escaped in a blue sedan with Washington plates, never to be found. They did find two weapons, uh, a 45 caliber and a 38. Police from all parts of the state are looking for it. A week before the bank heist, a car driven by employees of the Light and Traction Company in Salt Lake City was robbed. The police connected this robbery to the Camus robbery. The Traction Company car driven by E.J. Rosevar and occupied by Miss F.E. Manning and A.B. McKean was crowded to the curb in a daylight holdup August 15th near Broadway and 3rd East. Two of the three bandits in the other car leaped to the sidewalk and took $2,465 in cash and $600 in streetcar tokens from Miss Manning, car, the car barn cashier. The three were en route to a bank when the holdup was staged. The 45 was partially identified as the gun used at Camus. So as far as I can understand this light and what do they call it? The light and traction company of Salt Lake. That was their uh, streetcars. Back for UTA. Yeah. From the newspaper, on condition that they leave the county within 24 hours, George Kelly, 30, and John R J. Raymond, 53, were given a six-month suspended sentence in the city court by Judge Don R. Ellerston. The charge against them was carrying a concealed weapon. Attempts to connect the men with the robbery of the Camas State Bank on August 19th and the holdup of a Utah Light and Traction automobile on August 15th proved fruitless Salt Lake, uh, in Salt Lake, and they were brought to Provo to face the other charge. So basically, they got away with it. Just kept kicking the can. <laughs> Even though it was a new building, the Camas State Bank was again robbed in 1970. Who remembers this bank robbery? Couple people, yeah. Couple people, both in the history group. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now the bank was located in the building that was housed, uh, that has housed several businesses over the years: the Cutting Board, Vicks Pizza, etc. 
it would have looked like the bank on the right during the 1970 robbery. At the time, one side was the post office and the other side was the bank. There are a few newspaper articles referring to the 1970 robbery, but in his book, Not in My Wildest Dreams, Jim Sakia, one of the FBI agents that worked on the case, gives a more detailed account than the papers. I will use mostly his information. It became apparent, and this is Sakia talking, it became apparent that our bad guys had to have been in the bank from late Friday night until sometime early Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. The Utah Highway Patrol had investigated an auto accident nearly in front of the bank about midnight on Saturday. They were unquestionably inside the bank during that time. So all this stuff's going on, and these guys are just hanging out. Friday night, they burglarized the local gas station and stole the cutting torch. Saturday, the gas station opened, the burglary was reported, and a police agency investigated. At that point, no one was aware of what was occurring three buildings away. So that was the Chevron they stole from. Our bad guys had to get into the building by torching the steel grates on the windows in the alley. The audible alarm was deactivated by simply cutting a wire. There was no other security device. Hard to believe in 1970. Camus. No. The thieves simply unlocked the rear door from the inside. Then they cut through the door on the walk uh, to the walk-in safe. But but first, they attempted to pry open the walk-in safe door with the wrecking bar. The door snapped back. Blood was all over the floor, obviously a slashed hand from trying to open the door on the hinge side. Leads out to, America, to an area of medical facilities. With this amount of blood, someone is hurting. Okay. We, were, we hear back soon from the hospital in Provo. Charles Riley, a well-known all-around thug, was treated yesterday morning as an outpatient for a badly smashed left hand. One of the FBI agents had previously arrested Charles in the company of Fred Davidson, who, according to the sheriff's office, matches the description of the person who came to the hospital with Riley. The bad guys, now believed to be Riley, who is the injured one, and Davidson are now in the safe and their work is just beginning. Inside the walk-in vault is what is commonly called a cannonball safe. This is where the significant cash and valuables are kept. It is about four feet high, three feet wide, and two feet deep. A cannonball is about two inches of solid steel. They torch a hole through the top. This makes a good torch and better torch artist. These guys had learned their traded cutting up stolen cars and using a torch was second nature. Charlie had been previously arrested for interstate transportation of a stolen motor vehicle. Once the hole was penetrated, the cannonball was immediately filled with water. Wet money will dry out, burned money is useless. They then proceeded to enlarge the hole until they can get their arm in and scoop it out. The pro their proceeds were huge, but we believe our bad guys were identified. Of course, an all points bulletin was already put out on these two as they were well known to most Utah law enforcement. The garden hose had been removed from a backyard faucet nearby. So the sink basin in to, the back the sink. to the sink basin in the back of the bank where the hose was now hooked. The bank president, Moses C. Taylor, opened the door at eight o'clock on Monday morning with water running across the floor. His initial thought was a broken water pipe. As he, walk, as he walks behind the counter, here is a running water hose on the floor. When he notices that torched door hinges and immediately calls the police. To our good fortune, he keeps everyone out of the bank until the police arrive and the crime scene is well preserved. The place was a mess of wet papers. <clears throat> the agent who wrote this book said, the old timers of the FBI had me believing this type of bank heist was commonplace, so as I was sure I'd see it again. In 28 years investigating numerous bank robberies, larcenies, and burglaries, I never again saw anything quite like it. The author and his wife visited Camus in 2012. Nobody could remember the bank robbery. They didn't talk to these two ladies. <laughs> of course. When the FBI agent in charge was asked about the progress of the robbery, Russell P. Kalami were working on it. 
It is not our policy to give status reports on current investigations. A fairly thorough search of newspapers and other records do not mention the alleged suspects that the author, Jim Scalia, uh, believed were guilty. No records were found of anyone arrested for the crime. So we hope you've enjoyed this presentation we, uh, and hope that you've learned a little bit more about the hidden history and, and some of the things that happened here. Um, I want to mention also that uh, on the 26th, we will have a veterans presentation about some interesting things, particularly from World War I that our veterans in the Valley participated in that were quite unusual. Um, that'll be on the 12th of November. So uh, again, I hope that you learned something and um, thank you. Any questions or comments or concerns? Concerns. Jokes, rumors. <laughs> yes. Yeah, back in the day, it was the government, which was the church. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> there wasn't really a distinction. It was essentially all, uh, it, it was 10% of anything that you produced was brought, or anything that you produced or worked was brought to the tithing house, and you could take from the tithing house whatever you needed. Right. So, so nowadays, the members of the church pay 10% of their income. Back then, people didn't have income, so they had in-kind tithing, which were chickens, hay, whatever. But they used it as a, a bartering system for the people that needed stuff. So it was a bank. It was everything. But not optional? Not optional? What do you mean? You lived in the community. You contributed to the tithing house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah unless you were a Gentile, and then you didn't. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the church leaders were the government in the area. It was a kind of a theocracy. Don't quote me on that. But it was. <laughs> it was. Yeah. But in saying that, that's why we're still here and other communities didn't last as long or they they kind of petered out. They worked as a as a group, as a mostly organized group together in building things and keeping it together. And the economy was, it just worked. Mostly newspapers from the time. Yeah, we have subscriptions to the newspapers. So all of these were current. Um, it's a great online database of old newspapers that are uh, scanned over, and we uh, can easily go in and we cheat. <laughs> I'm just the voice. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? We tried to be as accurate as possible, but as you can see, like with the second bank robbery. I mean, he was sure that it was these two guys did not find a word about them in any newspapers, on any online databases at all. So I don't know if the guy had dementia when he wrote his book, but um, we didn't find anything about him. So. Surprisingly easy to get away with pretty major crimes. Yeah, apparently every, yeah, and they did. Interesting. Interesting. It was really creative ways of robbing these banks. Huh? So the so the drugstore and the bank were shared a wall. Well, makes sense to me. Yeah. 
You remember it too? Was it, do you think it was before or after the 1970 bank robbery? So it had to have been before. It then. had to have been before. Hmm. Any, any other comments, questions? Any other bank robberies <laughs> that, we, that we didn't know about? Oh, no. Probably went to the Lambert house. Yeah. Crazy man. So you know, uh, so these two ladies back here, their grandfather owned and ran the Simpson Drug. Built and and the theater and ran it. So that's the Simpson drug. They've got some good stories. They'll be doing the next lecture, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a bell from his house across the street, which the house is still there. And if he heard someone coming in the dr drugstore, the bell would ring. That's very ingenious. Better than what the bank had. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, thank you again for coming.